Thank you for attending this professional development series offered by the Department of History. My name is Dr. Jen McNabb and I serve as head of the department here. And I'm joined this afternoon by TJ Warren, who is the Assistant Director of the Office of Career Services here at UNI. And today we will be talking about networking your personal brand and e-recruiting and TJ will offer some great advice and resources about how to make sure that you spend your time at UNI becoming career ready. So TJ, I'll turn things over to you. Awesome. Yes. Well, thanks for having me, Jen, and I'm glad to be here to, to share some insight, especially during these times and, and what that looks like. So uh, as Jen alluded to, I am uh, one of the assistant directors in the Career Services Office here at UNI. I also serve as kind of the liaison to the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, so a contact and resource for you at all times. Uh, fun fact for you, I'm a huge Superman fan, if you can't tell in the background. First lesson today would be when interviewing, try to use something that's less distracting, okay? Because I'll be honest with you right now, I'm operating with two computers. I've got some colleagues um, who might interrupt, and I want to be in a space where I can totally focus and, and offer insight. So that's this isn't a normal uh, thing that I would recommend, but I want to first touch on uh, resumes. So just want to show you an example and what to kind of be looking for as you're developing those. I'm just going to spend a brief amount of time. Let me share my screen here. So essentially with a uh, resume, and I'm showing you my calendar real quick. Let me get over here to the resume. This is a, a typical generic format that we have been instructed by employers that looks really good and that they appreciate. So this is why we offer this as a template. You'll notice there's the, the header at the top with email and phone information. The general resume part would be where your name is at. And actually one of the things, this is a little outdated, we're starting to take physical address off because you will not see employers reach out to you through, uh, through mail. So but very typical resume. You've got the, the different sections, education, experience, any types of you know leadership opportunities or activities that you've engaged in while in college. This is what we're looking at here for something to put together. Everything on the, the right hand side is right justified. So that's something else to be to be mindful of that your dates are off to the right. Um, you've got different things in terms of um, strong bolding, really strong bullets. And if there's any uh, like just generic pieces of information I could give to you on resumes, format, format, format is huge. The average look of a resume is about five to seven seconds. So if you think about that in terms of somebody looking at this at a glance, it's got to be clean. It's got to be sharp. We also want to have strong uh, action verb statements. So when you're listing positions, you'll see from the bullets there, we want to make sure those are strong statements articulating what we've done through those experiences and really give an employer a sense of your experience, skill sets, and knowledge. So the, I kind of mentioned this too, that five to seven seconds, resumes are so incredibly uh, subjective. What I tell you is going to be different from somebody in our office, from a parent, from a peer, we all have different insights. So at the end of the day, this is your document and you do with it what you will. And I really think that that's important. A couple of quick things. I think objective statements aren't as helpful. So I wouldn't really include an objective statement. Again, that's a subjective thing. Uh, another item I would say is putting education first. So that when you're looking at job descriptions, they're usually saying master's preferred, bachelor's required. If an employer sees your education first and that you meet that check mark, that's an automatic uh, win for yourself. So, so again, this is a typical resume format. And we do have on our website, I've got this handout here. It's an action verb statements handout that can really help you hone in and focus on how can I articulate my experiences. All of them should start off with a strong action verb. And they really should be different. So you notice that we have different categories within this document. So taking a look at that, using different words each time for your bullets is really going to set you apart and set you up for success when creating your resume. So I mentioned that this is on our website. We have a variety of tools out there that I'd encourage you to go to. 
first of all, I want to just mention our job board is accessible through our, our, our site, so you can access that. And then our resumes and interviews, there's a variety of different templates here, including uh, so you can get a look at, you know, that general resume, but also including these little Word documents. So when you click on the W, you've got this template that's built from scratch. And essentially, I can just plug and put my information into this document. Um, you know, obviously, I would change the address and format it accordingly. But really, you could just jump right into starting your resume if you haven't already using one of our, our mock templates. So yeah, a lot of good stuff on here. The Power Verbs documents on here, even a cover letter and tutorial that you can access, some sample bullets, even practice interview questions. And I really recommend practicing in advance. So lots of different stuff here on our, our website to check out, including job searching resources. And more recently, we've developed you know, uh, a scheduling system that's a little bit different. So if you want to schedule an appointment with us, our contact information is here and our calendar as well. So you would just click on an appointment and schedule with me directly. If you're looking for a resume critique or mock interview, we'd ask you to click on this here. And again, an, a simple scheduler to get you signed up. Lastly, I will say today, uh, recession time is a hard time to, to find jobs and, and seek those out. I will say, though, jobs are out there. Employers are looking for individuals to, to join their organizations and, and help them carry out their mission. So don't get discouraged by this, but we do have a resource here on our, our website that's really geared more towards you know, a recession-based job search. So lots of different pieces of information you can access again from our homepage under this find a job today. So that's a little bit about our website and our resume, uh, the resume resources that we have. I'm going to shift things over to online interviewing and just give you three key tips. So let me come back here to stop sharing my screen and then you can see me here. So the three tips that I have for you First of all, location and attire. Those two pieces are very key to online interviewing. So again, I mentioned the background. I would look for something that's solid, professional to utilize for your background and space. And attire is just as you would dress up for an interview. You know, wearing a, uh, a suit, a nice shirt or blouse, a tie, even dressing uh, with a pants, of course, and your your dress and even dress shoes. Getting yourself all prepared in that attire makes you ready for the interview. So, and and I think it's so important to to play that part even in an online setting. The less distraction, the better. So nothing real big on the earrings or making sure that you're combed, uh, hair and brushed. All of that stuff is is just as uh, valuable. How to respond, that's the other thing that I would say. So this is point number two, where to look. So if I'm interviewing, I'd look right at the camera. It's basically showing that eye contact uh, if you're using the camera. And, you know, you'll have a lot of people that are taking notes. And so it might feel awkward to even look at the camera and you might want to look down at your screen. But it, I think it really helps to have that central point of looking and making uh, eye contact. So be comfortable with note takers and silence as well. You know, it can be very awkward to have silence in this technological space when I'm not one-on-one -on -one with you. I think the silence is okay. It's giving you space to kind of pause and breathe, get rid of some of those nerves, and then also giving the employer time to take notes and kind of gear up for the next question. Lastly, the third point I would say is this, this is a normal interview, but come with a backup plan. So sometimes technology doesn't work. Make sure the employer has your phone number. You might be doing a phone, phone call if the digital technology is not working. So being prepared for the phone call, it's kind of the same thing. We're carrying forward an interview the same way we would in person, uh, but we want to make sure with that phone call then uh, you're okay and comfortable with silence as well. So those are my three tips. Again, interviewing uh, on the computer is just the same as in person, but you've just got that, that screen and making sure that you have a central point to look at, a non-distracting background, and just feeling more comfortable with that. If you are somebody that is really nervous 
you know, I'd encourage you to do a power stance. So it's kind of like a Superman stance. You just stand up for about two minutes and you'd be amazed at the confidence you get just from that. It's a simple thing of standing up straight and kind of uh, bulking up your chest and kind of feeling like, you know, I've got this. It gives you that sense of confidence. So try to get those nerves um, worked out a little bit beforehand, and I think you're going to be fine. So those are, are the interviewing, the the resume, and the bulk of what I want to spend our time in, on is the job search and networking. Because obviously that is uh, where the biggest challenge is probably currently. So I do want to mention what can I do with history? You know, a lot of times I'll get parents that are very concerned of, you know, what what can my son or daughter do with with history? What can I actually, um, may, uh, you know, career-wise do? And it's interesting. I want to show this document with you. What this is, and it looks a little chaotic. It shows you, and see if I can zoom in here. This is the list of majors that we have at UNI, and then they're, they're represented by all the colorful schemes off there to the left. Off on the right, you'll see gray kind of areas of industries, and so showing you exactly what, um, where history is going, and you'll notice that they branch off into almost any industry. It's really interesting. So I make the argument that your major really can go any direction uh, if you're history or not. And you'll notice that with history, you can almost do anything. Now that can be scary and it can be awesome in some sense. Uh, but I, I just want to give you that assurance that there are things out there in industries in which you can go into. It's a matter of providing yourself in an interview, talking about transferable skill sets, telling what you've actually done to an employer or in your, your college experience, work positions, organizations, all of that kind of stuff you have to articulate well to an employer. So, so literally, literally you can do anything in history. Your network is the most helpful resource uh, during a job search. And I will tell you, this is even more more important during the recession. So every job that I've ever had, I can actually conclude that it can be tied to a network of, of some sort. Supervisors, teammates that I've had, every position that I've had has, has been um, obtained by having some sort of network connection. So networking, it can take you anywhere. I think the exercise I would encourage you to do to kind of get you brainstorming about networking is think about the job that you want and then think about what are the things incorporated with that job, the tasks, the responsibilities. What is it that makes that really meaningful to you? Why do you want to obtain that kind of a position? Then also think about the skills and experiences that you have to, to actually make that happen and get you there. And then these two points are the probably the most important. Brainstorming 10 organizations that you should seek out that are connected to that work or, or and I would actually say 10 individuals you might want to connect with who might be or have a connection to that work. And if you do that, you'd be surprised at the networking that you already have in place and where that alone can take you. There's a variety of networking opportunities out there, including LinkedIn, which I'll talk about and share here in just a minute. But really, though, you that network, the people that you know, the organizations that you're aware of, connected to the type of work that you want to do, you'd be amazed how well connected you are and how well those uh, people and organizations will take you to where you want to go. So I encourage you to think about that exercise. Again, job you want, skills and experiences you have to make it happen, 10 organizations you might want to seek out, and 10 individuals who might be able to get you there. Now, I do want to jump into LinkedIn. From our perspective, Career Services believes that LinkedIn will be kind of a job um, guru site of the future. So much of our networking is taking place online. LinkedIn is this professional Facebook, and you'd be amazed at how you can access job searching and networking tools through this. So a couple of things I want to show you in terms of LinkedIn, a basic profile. I'm just going to show you mine because uh, this is what I know and understand. The most important part is this piece right here, the top, where you have your image, your title, 
and even a summary of your experiences and what you're looking for. As somebody who is going to be entering the work world, you know, making this title something as history major, looking for opportunities in dot, 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 that would be a helpful title for yourself. Your summary, mine's more, I have more experience, I've been out in the working world for a while, so mine's a little philosophical. This can also be that space where you highlight and indicate what you've done and what you're interested in in actually finding. And then throughout, LinkedIn is kind of this online resume. So the resume that you construct and put together, putting the bullets and experiences that you've had directly within your LinkedIn is perfectly fine. So you'll notice I have the bullet points, when and where I started, location, all of that that you put on your resume can be implemented here. You also have some nice features of maybe showing an artifact or two of things that you've accomplished uh, with those experiences. And if I scroll down even further, I've got my education here, which is something you include on your resume too. But there's a lot of different profile sections that you can add in. I personally have certifications that, um, you know, that I've uh, uh, obtained. I've got volunteer experience and even skills and endorsements. The beauty of LinkedIn is that people can endorse you for the skills that you had and the experiences you've had. So you can list up to 50 and people can say, yes, this person is actually uh, gifted in public speaking or has done coaching. And then you'd be surprised, you know, accomplishments is stuff that you can uh, include as well, but you'd be surprised by just even clicking on interests and collecting those as groups and areas that you follow. Employers are looking at who you follow and, and will also um, give you some sense of personality, um, who you are and what you are looking at professionally. So that's a basic profile. I also want to show you, as a UNI student, you have access to, and actually I won't even type it in, I've got it right here, our University of Northern Iowa networking page through LinkedIn. We have 81,000 alums uh, tied into this, and actually that's jumped up about 5,000 since last week. So yeah, 81,000 alums, friends, that are connected to this network. If you click on alumni, I can see where this network, um, where people live, where they work. I can see what they do and what they study. So from history perspective, I'm just gonna type in history. This becomes a tag. And if I scroll down, I then begin to see current students, a lot of current students on here but then professionals out in the working world and what they're doing. This is where you build your network. When I click on connect, I can send a little note and say, hey, I want to connect with you on LinkedIn, looking for opportunities and dot, dot, dot. And you can send an invitation and automatically you then have this connection. Now, in order to see people's names and their titles and what they're doing, I think you have to have at least a connection of 100 people. So you'd have to start building your network you can certainly add people in our office as well as your professors, and that starts to get you um, get, get those network connections. But this can be extremely valuable to you in terms of building that network, seeing where people work, trying to find new job opportunities, all of those kinds of things. TJ, so, before we migrate away, just a, a few observations and, and points of information. The history department does have an alumni LinkedIn page. Perfect. Um, so that is something that um, all graduates are invited to join. We are building our network as well. So you can get some very specific connections with successful history alums. And the other point is one I'd like you maybe to reflect on a little bit, and that's the image. Mm. You select for your LinkedIn profile. Um, this is not a spring break photo. This is not um, uh, uh, going to a concert photo. This is a professional image, right? A, a good headshot. Um, it doesn't have to be something that you pay for, but it should communicate um, your level of professionalism, correct? Tell Absolutely. Us more about the photo. <laughs> yes. So typically we have a booth uh, during our 
career readiness days and they take place before job fairs and you can take a free headshot, um, you know, with our, our photographer on campus and then they email that to you. So that's one way of obtaining a really professional shot. The other thing is, is our cell phones are really, um, quite handy nowadays. I mean, they even do kind of a portrait mode. So my colleague, Matt Neese from our office just took this outside on a sunny day and it looks like a professional shot too. It automatically did some of the blurring in the background. You know, his face is right there. It does look really sharp. So you can use your cell phone even on a, on, you know, a, a plain background or something like this outside. Now it's funny you mentioned that uh, because we've got <laughs> 10 examples of terrible LinkedIn photos here. So I'll just go through these quickly. Cropped and blurry. You know, we don't want anything like that. We want it sharp. Using just a screen grab that maybe has your picture in it uh, in the background there. Stay away from that. That queen the a second? Who, who used that? To right? Exactly. It's bizarre. So the proportion squeezed, uh, you want to make sure that it, the picture is an appropriate size so it, so it doesn't smush your face. Make sure you're not miles away in the photo. Here's what we were talking about, party scene. Uh, we want to stay away from that. And if the photo is not square, so you'll notice the back, uh, the black areas here, because this is a, you know, a vertical photo, we want to kind of zoom in. If you can't see the person's face, that's also inappropriate. Poor lighting, using a logo instead. Really, a logo is for a group page or a professional organization. And then a tiny photo. If I were to click on this, it'd be extremely pixelated and hard to view. So, yeah, photo is everything. Uh, and it will, you know, serve as that point of, should I really take this person seriously? So yeah, quality photo makes sense. Yeah, great question. Okay, anything else on LinkedIn? Well, I, I do want to ask a follow-up. You mentioned at the career services page that there was information on building a cover letter, but we're yeah. now drifting away uh, from the hard copy inquiries. Yes. Jobs or responses to job ads, um, sort of on typed paper that stuffed in an envelope, sort of old school. So talk to us a little bit about e-recruiting. And I would put LinkedIn in that category of e right. Right. We know that employers are browsing LinkedIn pages, looking over people's photos and their about information as a means of building their team. Yeah, absolutely. No, I you know, there's definitely a lot of job searching uh, sites out there that, you know, you simply upload your resume and your cover letter and your your profile submitted even here with LinkedIn through the jobs page. If I were to click on a position here, let's say I want to be a creative writer with Strategic America. I mean, I click on this position, it gives me a job description. And with LinkedIn Easy Apply, you simply hit that button uh, and confirm it, and it will send your whole profile. And that serves as your resume or cover letter. So there are some unique circumstances with e-recruiting. Uh, basically, follow directions. You know, you, you follow the directions of of the actual job searching tool that you're looking for. Or, I mean, there is this notion too, if I see a position listing on a website, but they don't have any apply button, then you're, you're essentially emailing, you know, that employer, your resume cover letter. But the typical documents are our resume cover letter for e-recruiting. Now, if it's something like LinkedIn, you're just submitting your profile. So, yeah. This very handy feature of showing connections to you and I to the company of interest, right? Absolutely, yeah. And and you know, this is why we think it will be the way of the future for recruitment because it's so easy and simple. And so it's great to have this LinkedIn profile up and up to snuff uh, right away. Well, and it creates a digital network. So yeah. Now you know that there are alums uh, from you and I who have a position in this company, and those might be people that you can reach out to or that you are already connected with, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And you can also reach out to individuals and say, hey, I see you're part of this organization. Can you tell me about it? What's the mission? What's the why behind the organization? 
Do you like it? Do you like working there? You can ask some of those real world questions and get to know because to be honest with you, when it comes to the job search, you are interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. So, Great point. And in our event last week with uh, an area teacher, he mentioned that having questions at the end of the interview to ask the interviewers is key. You want absolutely interested, but you're also trying to find out if the organization is a good fit for you just as much as they are trying to find out if you're a good fit for them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Two, if you want just two free questions to ask, you know, after an interview, I would go with, why do you work here? Hmm. Because that's a really good question in, in showing vested interest, but also gives you a sense of what's it like. Um, if they even also offer up how many years they've worked there, you can s- kind of get a sense of a red flag to see, you know, this person's been here two years. This person's been here one year. I, I don't know about this. There might be high turnover. But if somebody's been there 15 years, another seven, another's eight, people stick around. And that's a great sign for a company or organization. So uh, that's a great question to ask. The other one that I would ask is, what's your culture like? And, you know, if people are getting a little hesitant to answer that, you there's a red flag there. But if they say, you know, we have potlucks on Fridays and, you know, everybody is very comfortable working with each other. We're very collaborative. That's a good place to work. So so those are two that I would offer up automatically. But, yeah, come prepared for questions. Otherwise, it seems like you're not interested. Good yep. So one other thing that I will point you to in terms of job searching, obviously there's Indeed and Monster out there as job searching tools. There's actually a lot. In fact, one that I just stumbled across, Career One Stop, is an excellent has an excellent uh, job searching tool. USA Jobs is another one that I would offer up to. You can look at association pages, so historical associations that you might be a part of. They typically have a job board and different community websites. So looking at, uh, you know, if I'm interested in going to, to Des Moines, I'm going to look at the, the Greater Des Moines Partnership or looking at their, you know, city administration page. Those are the ways in which we can also find other positions. So I do want to mention too, if you are interested in nonprofits, I have yet to find a really good, you know, job searching site for nonprofits, what I will do is I'll just Google nonprofits in a location, use the map feature and kind of see where people are at. You have to move things around a little bit because sometimes the the page will populate and update. But then this just gives me that general sense of, well, I want to work with North Des Moines. Uh, let's, looks like girls here. Or let's see, I have a dream foundation. Typically, they'll have some sort of website off here that you can look I don't know why it's not populating here. Maybe I'll look at nonprofits. There we go. So it's showing me the map. And over here, I've got website access. So this is a good way to kind of see what's out there. And as I move my map across, other nonprofits will populate. But yeah, if I click on one, I can go out to their website see what they're all about. And then usually employer or hiring pages are scrolling down to the bottom, looking at, you know, a careers page or employment opportunities. That's essentially what we want to look at. If it's not at the bottom, then perhaps it's at the top too. So, so that's a way in which you can look at nonprofits out there. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here just for a few minutes and kind of close this out. So if there's a few other tips that I could give you in terms of right now in the job search market, it would be expanding your locations and possibilities. So you probably are not going to get your dream job right now. And I hate saying that, but that is a reality. So an opportunity to go to grad school um, or take a position where you can build transferable skill sets, that's what we, we're kind of looking for right now. Additional education, whether that's a two-year program or, again, grad school, those are strong possibilities. Location-wise, I'm oftentimes telling students three to five locations, you know, considering those that many areas um, 
But I would say in a recession, we want to expand that to about five to nine. So looking at five location, five to nine locations regionally of where you want to be. I think that connecting with Chamber of Commerce is, is helpful. Many of them will have some sort of professional, young professionals group, and that's an excellent networking opportunity and a way to get your name and experiences out there. And I really want you to know that places are hiring. In fact, I was on LinkedIn and in their news feed, they had who's hiring right now. And there are thousands of jobs out there, but it's a matter of taking initiative, taking action and seeking what's out there and not giving up. Um, I will give, maybe I'll give my story here at the end, depends on if we have questions or not, uh, but I will talk in, in further detail about that. But, but yeah, I mentioned the job board. The, uh, a great kind of part-time uh, resource is Indeed Gigs. So it is a gig economy in terms of if you've got a certain skill or passion that you have, if you want to pursue like those little side jobs that can give you a little bit of cash right away, uh, that's an excellent avenue to, to start to build experience. And it shows an employer, if you're having a, a hard time finding that full-time position, doing a gig here or there, build your experiences and show you didn't just sit around watching Netflix. So that can be helpful as well. If anyone's interested in me sending them some resume handouts, LinkedIn tips, and then I also have a, you know, a job search tracking tool, which can be beneficial as well for networking and finding work. I can send those. Just email me, tj.warren at uni.edu. But that's really what I've got. So, Yeah, let me ask you one follow-up. Um, and this has to do with, uh, I know, an interest of the Office of Career Services, which is seeing students early and often. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with history majors for a long time and been involved with career services for a long time. And I know that it really is a four-year project to spend your time during your university education getting ready for the next step. So just give us one tip, if you would, for first-year students, for second-year students, for third-year, and for fourth-year. What's, what's maybe your number one piece of advice for students at those different stages of their collegiate experience? It is so hard to just give one piece of advice, even like preparing for this conversation. I mean, we could spend an hour on resumes and what that looks like uh, with each of these topics. But, you know, I gave this some thought. I think for freshmen, get involved and track your experience. You know, getting involved in volunteer clubs and orgs, those involvement opportunities lead to some great things. You know, I know many are working part-time jobs and that's just as helpful too, but leadership and volunteer experience is valuable. Employers love seeing that on resumes. In fact, we have a study that we did in 2015, and they looked at employers, um, our employers, and or students getting jobs. And students who had a 322 experience were 100% successful getting a job or going to graduate school within six months if they had a 322 experience. What that is is a 3.0 GPA, two leadership opportunities, and two professional experiences. And all students that had that got a job or went to grad school. So it's really important for that involvement piece. I know we say it a lot, but it is so crucial. Sophomores, oh yeah. Just one quick follow-up for professional experience. So this would be something like an internship. Yep. Okay. And we part-time job. Have some of those, of course, in the history department as connected with our public history degree and all students are invited to get real world prep through an internship program of some sort. So good. To Absolutely. Know. Yeah. And oh, go ahead. <laughs> What's that? It said, and the sophomores, what can they be doing? Well, I, I do want to say too, the three, two, two, you could move that three to another section. So let's say you have a 2.75. Then we saw the same success. If you had three professional experiences, or three leadership opportunities and leaderships, clubs, and orgs, uh, volunteer experience. So, so if you don't have that 3.0 GPA, we want to see that, but if not, then some of those other experiences will, you'll still be successful. So 
Uh, sophomores, I would encourage to take on something big. You know, take on an initiative of leading an event or, you know, um, being a part of a major volunteer experience, like maybe you're leading a group of students for Habitat for Humanity. You know, just something big. Take on something big because ultimately that will lead you to a great uh, position to be taking an internship, which should be taken during sophomore, after your sophomore year or junior year. So take on something big. Uh, juniors seeking out an internship opportunity, that's that's the big one. And then our resume needs to start taking, you know, final shape. We need to start having that polished and only including college experiences. We can start to take the high school stuff off. Seniors, build time into your schedule to job search. Don't leave it until the you know you're you're done with your last semester and the job search starts that summer. I, I mean, it, it is possible to still find work, and I know that you're busy, but the sooner that you get on that, the better. Um, actually, we have a lot of employers that are hiring in the fall. That's where our career fair takes place in September, and employers are looking for students even at that time. And what many of them will do is hire a student and wait until they're done you know, with school when they officially start. So I would say start fi finding job opportunities. Um, it is a full-time job to find a job. So, you know, the, the sooner you get on that, the better. Those are fantastic points. And I would just add from the professor standpoint, spend some time in each of your years at UNI developing relationships, professional relationships with your professors. They will be invaluable to you when it is time to offer letters of recommendations or to take phone calls from agencies who want to vet your credentials. Don't mm -hmm. just be a face in the crowd, right? Really work to distinguish yourself. That means going to visit a professor in office hours. I was also thinking as you were tracking the sophomore and junior process, maybe doing an undergraduate research project. That exactly. Thing to put on a resume, but would also get you some really valuable experience in working with a professional in the field. You'd be working with an acting historian and as a result, getting real career ready kind of skills into shape. Yeah. And actually one of the top skills, one of the top five skills that our employers are looking for are analytical skills. I mean, we are data driven, you know, in this world. And so the ability to analyze and, and research is important. Those are valuable skill sets to, to mention. I didn't mention, you know, too the academics, like you can use working on a group project as an example for one of your interview questions, you know, so, and I know that you do group work. So that's important too. Absolutely. And just as we were thinking through the kind of things that happen in a typical interview, you want to be sure that you have follow-up questions. You're likely going to get a question um, about a challenge that you face or a failure that you've experienced. You can draw on your academic experiences to discuss responses to those questions and then pivot them into things that you've learned. Right. Mm -hmm. group project that wasn't very successful because there wasn't enough collaboration. And so you've learned to take away from that, that it's important to be clear and transparent in communication, that mm -hmm. it's important to set deadlines, that it's important to have an understanding of who's doing what. Those are the kinds of things that employers will be quite enthusiastic to hear. Correct. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Almost anything that you experience or do or engage in is fair game for, for selling yourself on. And I think that one of the things I tell students too is that, you know, there's a difference between being cocky and confident. You have to be willing to talk positive about yourself or an employer won't hire you. They won't consider you. So and with the cocky and confident, I can say, you know what, I'm pretty good at shooting free throws all day. I can make 10 for 10 on occasion, you know, or I can say I'm pretty good at shooting free throws. I've gone 10 for 10 on occasion. You know, your tone matters too. So don't, don't sell yourself short. I think that's a fantastic point. And it's one that 
recent college graduates can sometimes struggle with. Right? They're still building that sense of confidence and professional competence, but you have to, what's the great line? Fake it till you make it. A yep. little you have to modulate as you're suggesting. You don't want to be overconfident, but you do want to communicate your sense of competence to potential employers. If you don't believe in you, there's no reason that they should. Right. Yeah. And if it's something where you don't have a lot of experience with, you know, but there's probably a connection to, don't think that it's insignificant. Share that connection, say that you're willing to learn and that there's, there is something that you can bring to that task or project or position. So. Well, I think this has all been fantastic advice. I know I've learned a few things from our <laughs> conversation today. I, uh, some of the LinkedIn t- uh, tips and tricks. I, I have a LinkedIn account with more than 500 connections, and I hadn't seen a few of the things that you showed today. So I'm going to thank you for your time and your expertise, and I'll remind our listeners First, that the History Department's Career Resources page has links to many of the sites that TJ discussed today. And second, get to the Office of Career Services virtually if you need to, as is the case now. Um, But there are fantastic people there to help you meet your professional goals. It is one of the services that you and I provides its students, so you all need to be sure that you take advantage of the opportunities that career services will give you. So Absolutely. Thank you so much, TJ, and um, I, I hope all of the students come to see you really soon. Likewise. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care.